Well, if we can take a break at least for a little while here from March Madness and dive into scriptures. If, even if you're not a basketball fan, you at least need to follow a little bit. March Madness, I mean, just when Virginia got knocked out, what a game. I mean, it's historic, right? Now, I'm, I'm pulling for Purdue. I'm really not a Purdue fan in, in most any case, but for some reason, I just, I just feel this draw. I just, I have to root for somebody like that. But turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 4, will you? Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. I want to talk to you about temptation. Temptation. What a great topic, huh? <clears throat> I remember when we were in youth choir growing up. You remember this, Jason? Um, uh, Jason was a soloist. Um, uh, <laughs> no, but we were in youth choir growing up, and we sang this song called Temptation Curve. Do you remember that song? And Dwayne rolled up the milk duds or whatever in his sleeve, and it was the corniest, weirdest song we ever sang. But I just, all week I've been thinking about Temptation Curve. I won't sing it for you, but I want to talk about temptation. How do we deal with temptation? How do I confront temptation? It's not a question of whether uh, we're going to be tempted because you will be all the time. How are we going to deal with that? Well, how did Jesus deal with it? And, and uh, from how Jesus dealt with it, what can we learn? So we want to talk about that today. If you're not to Luke chapter 4, get there. I, I was uh, um, studying this week and I came across this illustration. I thought it's just a one sentence thought. I thought it was really good. It's from a Puritan writer named Thomas Brooks. Uh, he, he, it's Jason's great, 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 great uncle, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Twice removed. Um, he uses this amazing analogy. He says, Temptation is nothing more than bait on a hook. I mean, just let that sink in. Temptation is when the enemy, Satan, takes something that looks so good and puts it on that hook. And if he can get you to bite, he's got you. And he starts reeling you in and pulling you deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So how can we... If he's got that hook right there, and we see, how can we say, no, <laughs> I'm not going there? Do you know, the enemy's entire goal is to give you whatever will compel you to bite. It's not just this that he wants you to get. He wants to get all of you. He wants to pull you in and, and, and uh, completely take over you. What is it that he'll use to entice you? Maybe it's money. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's just the temptation to be the most popular. Maybe it's the temptation of sexual immorality. Maybe it's the temptation for, to get rich quick. It's like if you just jump on this, oh, yeah, and then he just reels you in. You're up to your, 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 your gills and debt. And What is it for you that the enemy just baits that hook and lays it out there. You see, Satan, uh, if he came to you and said, hey, I got a great idea. How about this? Come, come bite on this one. How about this one? Divorce. No. I got a great idea. Here's a good one. Come bite on this one. Um, what if for generations, uh, the, the, your family lineage is going to be torn apart with angst and anger and bitterness because of your gossip and your slandering and you can't zip your mouth and you just harsh words come out? What if, what if, what if that could happen? What if you could like completely destroy for generations your family? Does that look enticing? No. But he'll, he'll put that, that out there, just somebody at work just yapping about somebody, and you're like, oh, I know something about that too, maybe. Well, I don't know if you heard or not, but this and this and this. And, and oh, and I think this, too. I mean, he'll put that there, and then he'll start reeling you in, and it will destroy, like a cancer destroy your life. If he can just, you see, he doesn't put the reality on that hook of what this is going to lead to. He puts what looks really cool right here, right now. And as we look in chapter 4, we see Satan comes to the Lord Jesus and he baits the hook continually for 40 days with all kinds of temptations that, uh, that are just constantly battling. And some of us, 
We, we're battling temptation unsuccessfully today. And God's plan and God's desire for you is that you never even go there. So let's talk about that. Because as we look at the temptation of Jesus, we find ourselves meeting a God who in every way identifies with us who are tempted. If you get anything out of this message today, I want you to get, get, get this. See how Jesus responded to these temptations, not out of his divinity, though he could have, but out of his humanity. I want you to see that as we study this, just off the top, just I want you to see that. Because if Jesus can go through all the temptation he went through and not sin, we got good news, right? Then I have the power of Jesus inside of me. And I can live victoriously as well. Let's look at this. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Just a couple of quick hits here in the first couple of verses that I want to show you. Jesus, I'm going to keep stopping, so stay with me. Jesus, we know who he is, full of the Holy Spirit, right? Full of the Holy Spirit. Let's just stop right there. Man, if I went to church more often, I would not deal with the temptation I if I could just develop that discipline of prayer and Bible study, man, if I could like be that person that, that I just want to be, like the prayer, the, I, if I just had every book of the Bible memorized, if I could say it backwards and forwards, well, that might be a little weird, but um, if, if I could just be more spiritual, then I could get past this temptation and I would never even be tempted. Wrong! Jesus was what? He was full of the Holy Spirit at this point. I mean, he's full of God. He was full of himself, literally. But he's, he, and yet, yet he was what? He was tempted. He was tempted. You see, temptation itself is not the sin, right? Let's be clear on that. Being tempted is not the sin because if, G, if being tempted was a sin, then Jesus would have sinned, and we know this. He, he was tempted in all ways, yet he knew no sin. And so the temptation isn't the sin. It's are we going to give in to that? Are we going to jump on that? And then that, that temptation turns into sin. So Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit. Um, and that's a, in fact, even before that, return from the Jordan. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, return from the Jordan. He could have even been wet. I mean, Jesus was just baptized. Were you here last week? You remember that? Jesus was water baptized, contextualize this, put it in the context. Jesus had just been water baptized. I mean, literally, he could have been still dripping a little bit. We don't know, but it was fresh from the Jordan, returned from the Jordan, and was led by the Spirit. Let me just toss this out. I don't have time to unwrap this, but if you're following Christ, I'm not saying you're perfect, but you're doing everything you can to follow Christ and put your faith in Christ and serve the Lord you, you, you have to rest in something. There's not one thing that can happen to you that Jesus and God doesn't say, I will allow that. Now that's faith and that's a challenge because we all know there's sometimes when things happen to us, we're like, I, I don't understand that. And I, I, I don't have time to unpack it. But it's interesting that the scripture, Luke records, it was... The Spirit of God was part of this. <clears throat> Led by the Spirit to go be tempted? Does that make sense? Not necessarily. But you think on that. Okay, keep going. In the desert. Um, now, I, th I think it's because I grew up with the Warner Brothers uh, uh, cartoons, you know, Bugs Bunny, Roadrunner. Um, that was all Warner Brothers, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. Um, but whenever I think desert, I can't help but to think Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote, right? You know, me, me. <laughs> And, and, um, and some of you, I'm sorry, you weren't blessed with that opportunity. Um, but Saturday morning cartoons, the desert. Okay, the desert of Judea that Jesus went to, it was desolate. It, there was wild animals. And um, I'm, I'm told I've never been there. One day, I'm going to Israel. Who's going with me? Every time I say that, I, I just want more and more hands to come up. Um, because I think it would be a great one day we're going to go. But um, I've never been there. But everyone that tells me, there's a lot of places in Israel and in that area that have changed since the days and times of Jesus, just because it was 2,000 years ago. I mean, even the terrain and stuff has changed a bit, whatever. But they say this desert of Judea, this area still looks desolate. It's yuck. It's, it's somewhere where you don't want to go hang out. It's just, it's bad news. And so that's where Jesus is being led to go, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. 
You can just toss something in there. The feel of this, we have recorded three temptations, right? But the feel of this is it was a non-stop. He was continually tempted. And so can you imagine for 40 days, <laughs> talk about your spiritual battles, for 40 days, non-stop temptation from old Diablo himself. I mean, just non-stop for 40 days. That's, we have three of them recorded, but the, the feeling, the sense of the, is that really it was, it was a non-stop. He ate nothing during those days. He was fasting. And at the end of them, surprise, surprise, he was hungry. You know, someone's introduced here that really wasn't, introdu- uh, wasn't even explained. The devil, Satan. Same person, different names for the same person. I just think as we're studying Luke, it's interesting to see. You go back to the beginning of Luke, and you see in the first two chapters people that are introduced to us. Oh, here's, uh, uh, um, uh, here's Elizabeth. Here's John the Baptist. And here's their husband, Zechariah. And, and uh, you've even got people like Simeon. In, in, at the temple, I mean, you've got Mary and, and Joseph. You've even got these shepherds that are introduced to us and, and the heavenly host that's brought in and you, there's a sense of understanding. I mean, there's several people in the first few chapters of Luke that Luke's like, I want you to understand who these people are. This is how they fit into the story, whatever. And then just, whoosh, whoosh, he just drops old Satan right in there. He just drops old the devil just right in there. Why is that? I don't know if I can answer that. Why didn't he take time to say, okay, now you need to understand who the devil was. The only thing I can come up with is this. They believed in him. They had already understood. I mean, it was just assumed. If you're reading this, if you're understanding, there's a devil and he's real. And we don't need to go any further because that's, he's, he's your adversary. He's like the antichrist. He's coming against Christ. And, and so I, that's my feeling. That's my thought. Why Luke didn't take more time. But I do think it's interesting as we study the whole of the book of Luke. It's interesting he didn't take a whole lot more time to describe that. He was hungry. And we get into these temptations and And as we start looking here, um, uh, let's look at how Jesus responded. Verse 3, the devil said to him, if you're the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. Question, could Jesus have turned that stone into bread? Of course he could have. Yeah, that would have been nothing. This is the dude that turned water into wine, right? So it wouldn't have been no. If you're hungry, is it a sin to eat? No, of course it's not. Then what's the temptation here? Well, part of the temptation is whether or not Jesus would obey Satan. Fill that in your notes, will you? Part of the temptation is whether or not Jesus would obey Satan. Satan is the one commanding him to do this, not God. And then secondly, Satan is calling him to meet a physical desire, an urge. You need to know that many of you and uh, my temptations are going to be natural appetites. Satan has a way of taking something that's healthy and that's good and twisting it and setting that hook, putting the bait right there. Do you know, um, let me keep this PG, understanding our crowd today, but listen, uh, uh, sexual intimacy is a beautiful, wonderful thing in marriage. God created it. God says, in fact, I want it to happen so you can procreate. I want to see more of you. God says, I want it to happen. I want you to enjoy it. Hello, read the whole Song of Songs, Song of Solomon. Read it. God meant for that to be a blessed thing, a beautiful thing. I want to, I want to use sexual intimacy in, in, the, in the bonds of a marriage to keep you pure and and keep you focused on one another and keep your eyes off other people keep it on one another and then the devil comes in and just but boy isn't it fun oh yeah in the bonds of marriage God says but outside of marriage you see Satan takes it and distorts it and when 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 that begins to happen outside of marriage that's when it gets ugly and it's sin and it's wrong you see the devil takes something that is uh, is a God creation and that's what we see here. Food, hello. Every one of us needs food. I love food. I'm thinking already, what's for lunch? <sighs> Last week it was a Taco Bell. <clears throat> I didn't realize that there's a certain establishment in our community whose drive-thru is not always open. 
I'll just leave it at that. And I sat there for like five, ten minutes waiting for them to talk to me. And then I pulled a little further and I saw in the window it didn't say drive through open. It wasn't lit up. And I was like, oh, I'm going to Taco Bell now. I'm not even going into this place. So we ended up at Taco Bell, which was fine. Um, it wasn't Taco Bell, by the way. Um, but, uh, okay, so lunch, food is a good thing. But you know what the devil was saying? It's like, he's using food, a good thing. Why don't you turn that rock and like, don't you need food? And he's like, listen, Jesus is like, mm, man doesn't live on bread. So bread alone. Um, but uh, Matthew even expands it, but every uh, word that comes out of the, the mouth of God. So um, what are you saying? The real temptation here is actually an attack on Jesus' identity. We talked about this some last week. Let me hit it some more. D- can you hear this? Look at your Bibles. Um, where, where am I? Oh, yeah, verse 3. If you are the Son of God, the idea here is you can, for that word, if you could use the word since, Listen, since you are the son of God, wait a minute. Let's connect this. Didn't we just hear that a couple of verses before? Ah, the devil was watching and listening, just like he watches and listens to us. When Jesus went into that water and was baptized, and at some point the sky split, right? And, and, and what did it say in, in, in Luke chapter 3? Um, this is my son and whom I'm well pleased. Who said that? God the Father. I'm talking just like, if you contextualize this, just a couple, maybe a day, maybe the same day, I don't know, but a day or two, three, or sometime soon before this, the sky literally split open, and God the Father said, this is my son and whom I'm well pleased. Remember, you, you declared that over one another last week, very awkwardly, but I'm so proud of you that you did. Um, this is my son. And so isn't it interesting, just a little bit while later, Satan's like, so, son of God, huh? It's kind of a snarky feeling. It's like, so, if you're the son of God, hmm, why don't you just, I don't know, take this rock, turn it into bread. I, I think it was really, uh, it was, a, it was a, an attack on, was he really who he says he was? And um, uh, you got you to get that tone in there. Now, let me make a point here about you and me. As Satan's attacking Jesus' identity, he's going to attack our identity as well. And let's make sure that we stand in the identity of who we are in Christ. Because who you think you are will determine what decisions you make and how you live life. Who you identify yourself as, do you think you're a victim? Then you'll live as a victim. Do you think you're a a born-again child of Almighty God? Then let's start living as a born-again child of Almighty God. And all, that we're adopted, that we're loved, that we're forgiven, that we have a marvelous inheritance to live out even right now on earth and in eternity. (laughs) Let's let that be our identity. I love the idea of being a dad. I love the idea of being a husband. I love the idea of being a leader, a pastor in this church, in this community. I love all these things. But the biggest thing I have to hang my hat on is the fact that I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's what identifies me. One time, I'll never forget it, standing right here in these altars. It was some time ago. This person hasn't attended our church for years. In fact, they moved away. But I remember it was it was like oppression. And I know for some of you that might be a new word, but this person was just oppressed with negativity. As the more I talked to this dude, the more it's, he's like, "I'm just I'm just a poor man. I'm just trying to get ahead. I just feel like I can't. I don't I don't ever get any breaks. I just I just." I was like, here's a guy that his whole life has probably been told he's never going to amount to anything. I mean, just this is where he's at. And I just started doing everything I could to speak life into him. I tried to do everything I could to just encourage him. Megan and I then took it on as an opportunity that we, we blessed him and his wife with some significant things. And, and, and over the next few weeks, even, I spent some time trying to talk to him, whatever, and they end up moving away. I wish I could tell you that he broke through that. I don't, I don't even know where he's at today. But this is what I know, is that somewhere along the way, he took on the identity of a victim. 
He took on the identity um, that wasn't the identity that God wanted him to have. And I just want to make it clear. See, in Christ, the moment you gave your life to Christ, victim, gone. Um, uh, um, orphan, gone, because now I have a heavenly father. I mean, uh, um, uh, someone who, who if, if, if your whole life people have just torn you, told you, that's gone. Because when you, when you invite Jesus in your life, you take on the identity of Christ and his righteousness and his holiness. And you are somebody through Christ. You, you have a new father. The church is your new family. Heaven is your new eternity. The spirit of God in you is a new power. And Satan's going to come at you and say, are you really forgiven? What would he say to Jesus? Are you really the son of God? And he's going to come at you and say, are you really forgiven? I, you were pretty much a knucklehead back then. I can't believe you did that. And are you sure that you're forgiven, that your sins are washed, those horrible things? Are you sure God forgives that, that God loves you? Because it looks like no one else loves you right now. See, the enemy will bring all these kind of, uh, uh, of questions towards you to try to destroy you. But what we have to do is we have to raise up the reality of what we know the Word of God says, that I am loved. In fact, I'm dearly loved. God so loved me that he gave his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. That's how much he, greater love had no man than this. Then he laid down his life for a friend. Hello, that's my Savior. That's who I am. I really want you to know that in Christ, you get a new identity. And out of that identity, you have a new future. That's why the Bible says, let us live up to what we've already attained through Christ. God loves us. He saves us. He forgives us. He gives us his righteousness. He adopts us. He cares for us. He prepares a place for us. Let's just live up to what we've already attained. That's who we are and what we have. But if you forget your identity, you'll destroy your future. If you start living for your own fame, your own desires, your own, you'll destroy it. Oh, you may see success in the world's eyes, but I just want to challenge every person in this room. Don't believe the lies of the enemy because he's a liar. In fact, his native language is lie. It's lying. And something doesn't need to be true to be devastating. It simply needs to be believed. Think on that. You see, the enemy can come in and say, hey, listen, you might as well jump now. You might as well get out now. You might as well just turn now. You might as well. And it might, not, it might, it might be the farthest thing from the truth, but because you believed it, it's devastating. Don't believe the lies. How does Jesus respond? Jesus responds by quoting Deuteronomy. He's quoting Deuteronomy three times here in this passage, and he says, it is written. The Bible says it is written, and, uh, and he comes back with Scripture. Let's make sure that we use Scripture not as a uh, good luck charm. I was just like, bling, we're just tossing it out there. And, ha, ha. It's like in, in Haiti, they've got these taxis. They call them tap taps. And all over these taxis, they have Scriptures written, and maybe the name of Jesus in Creole, and because it's kind of like good luck. Well, let's make sure as Christians, we're not just tossing scripture out there as good luck, but we're tossing scripture out there with a deep-seated belief that it is the truth of Almighty God. Amen? That's what we believe in. So here's an interesting thing before we go to temptation number two. Does Satan leave him? No. I know in my own life when temptation sets in, it's, it's about more than simply just tossing out a scripture or whatever. It's about a battle. And there's a war going on. In fact, second temptation... Here it is, verse 5. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of this world. I don't know what this looks like. If you, if you ever have the Bible app, get the Bible app for kids, and they have all these Bible stories and stuff in there. Watch the Bible app for kids version of this. It's really interesting. I don't know, he just threw that in there. Uh, verse 6, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The real issue is this, it's a worship issue. Here's what he says. Satan says to Jesus, you want glory, you want fame, you want power, you can do that without the cross, I'll give it to you. 
You don't have to go through all the beating and all the people coming against you and, and uh, like people turning on you, your closest disciples turning on you. You don't have to go through all that. You don't have to go to the cross. You want all the, the I'll give it to you. You just need to worship me. Now, some of you say, uh, Scott, I'll be honest with you. I've never been tempted to worship the devil. I'm good on that. <laughs> i got a lot of temptations, but to go to a coven and worship Satan, not so much. Well, here's the deal. Could you make a case that any worship that's not directed to our Heavenly Father is, in a sense, worshiping the enemy? I mean, worshiping Satan? I mean, not like coming right out and, and saying it, but... Let me, let me give you another, like a definition of sin. Every time we sin, we're choosing to worship something else. We're choosing to say that's more important than my God. Worship is not just what we do on Sundays together. It's what you look at is, is like an act of worship. What you say is an act of worship. What you do is an act of worship. Every time I take my debit card out and I buy something, I'm saying, this is important to me. I, it's not so much like I'm, I'm bowing the knee to Meyer for this thing of grapes, but I, I'm saying this is important to me. And so I'm, I'm using this to, okay, this is a part of everything I do. I'm, 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 I'm putting a value to something. And so it's, it's, in a sense, it's a worship act. And Satan comes to Jesus and says, it's a worship issue. I'll make you comfortable, successful, powerful. I'll fill your stomach. I'll give you all the pleasures that your mind could even conceive of. And how many right now are saying, um, yeah, I've given into that. I've taken the bait before, and I'm dying. And what we're saying is, I've taken my worship away from Almighty God and put it on my flesh, which really is from the enemy. Our goal is not to eat less of that bait. Our goal is not to get the bait off the hook. Man, if I can just go and just, like a, like a mouse, those little pesky mice that sometimes get the peanut butter, the piece of cheese, whatever it is, without getting it, it's like they get away. And they're just, they just kind of, they just like, somehow they just, and run away before it snaps them. And that's how some of us are. Oh man, if I could just if I could just just look at it once. I just look at it once and then or it's just a little flirtation with her. I know I'm married. I know I know she's married too. I know he's married. Whatever it looks like for you. I I, I know I shouldn't be flirting like this cuz we're both married, but boy, it's it's a lot of fun. I, I it, he's not going to reel me in. I'm just going to go and It just it's not like if I could just nibble a little less of it. It's if I could completely repent of sin and just completely stay away from it. I'm not going to worship my flesh and whatever the enemy puts on there, I'm going to go the other way. Our goal is to repent of sin and run from it. And so Jesus responds again by quoting Deuteronomy. This time he quotes chapter 6, verse 13. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve the real temptation issue, issue here really is a worship. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to put first? Question. Does Satan leave him alone? No. He baits the hook again. Third temptation. Look at it. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And if you are the son of God, and said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written... He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in, in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Don't lose the irony here. Who's quoting scripture here? Satan. Hmm. The devil knows the Bible. You better believe it. And he knows God. He knows you. In fact, every time he starts thinking about God, James says he shudders. He says, ah. he gets scared. Because he knows that God has all power. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Satan comes to Jesus. He's like, I notice you like the scriptures. Do you know, I happen to study them myself. And part of the temptation here is wondering if Jesus would believe Satan's twisting of the real meaning of this scripture. The real temptation issue here is trying to get Jesus to tempt God in order to prove himself. Hmm. Do you know your Bible? 
one, one of the, the challenging things for every believer in this place is if we get comfortable, spiritually. It's like, you know, I feel like things are going good right now. I feel like my life's pretty good. If we're, we're connected into the church. Pastor Scott did a whole series on that last fall about investing yourself, and I'm invested. I'm feeling pretty good. I think I might just sit back, and I'm going to take my helmet off and, and put my weapons down. I'm just going to sit back and relax and just get a little comfortable with, with life and myself. And Do you know that's the very place that the enemy wants you to be? Let me just shoot straight with you. The moment... You gave your life to Christ is the moment you put a target on the front and the back. And the enemy's going after you nonstop. There's no time when we can just like have a weekend off from Christianity. <laughs> have a weekend off from battle. I know that's not even fun, but it's truth. Let's, let's, let's be people who are always, even as you think about this, um, the devil's twisting scripture here. He's, he's making it look like one thing that it's really not. He's using this psalm, and um, God points in, in uh, Psalm 91, it's, it's, it's not test God and make him prove to you who he is. It's, it's if you faithfully serve God, he will lovingly help you in your time of need. So the enemy's twisting scripture, and there's others in our community, in our area, on our televisions, on the internet, throughout this world. That would do that exact same thing. And let's be ready. Let's be aware. Let's make sure that if we, man, something doesn't sound right about that. That sounds like, like he's, let's jump up on it. Let's, let's acknowledge it. Hebrews 4 says this, though, that Jesus was, was tempted in every way. Every way. And one way, even Jesus was tempted, was to twist Scripture and believe twisted Scripture. Luke 4, 13, and when the devil had ended Every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So when you're tempted, don't believe the lie that Jesus doesn't understand, that Jesus doesn't relate. Jesus has never been there. Jesus has never been married to my wife. Ah. Jesus has never been married to my husband. Jesus has never worked at my job. Jesus has never been tempted in the way that I've been tempted in this area. Listen, for 40 days without food, the enemy, nonstop temptation for 40 days is the sense and the feel you get. Now, when you read Jesus was tempted in all ways, I mean, you can begin to see, oh, yeah, I mean, 40 days. I mean, I could see how there could be a lot of temptations tossed his way. And he knew no sin. So um, uh, your circumstances are not unusual in that Jesus has been tempted in the same way that you've been tempted. He's there to help you. He's there to serve you. He's there to give you strength. And when it says that he was enduring every temptation, believe that. Whatever your temptation is, Jesus faced that temptation. And eventually, Satan left him forever? No. Because we see all the way through uh, the, uh, the tomb. We see over and over and over and over again. Um, when you feel like there's a season where, man, I don't really feel a lot of spiritual attack, right? don't really feel like the enemy's really tempting me a lot, that's not time to slough off. It's time just to beef back up, spiritually get ready, because he's, he's going to come back around. Um, for Jesus, this even looked like a, uh, a, one of his closest his disciples, Judas Iscariot, planned the murder of Jesus, right? I mean, if the devil wasn't behind that, what was? I mean, sure, God allowed it, but hello, so the devil's going to come and keep coming after you. So uh, why do I tell you this? Because I'm trying to depress you. I'm really, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to make you feel like, okay, check please, I'm out of here. No, I'm trying to encourage you. I'm trying to show you reality. If the devil comes after Jesus, he's going to come after you. So Scott, what can I do about it? Let's take the last few minutes and talk about it. Five quick things. The first thing, fill this in your notes. Be on the offensive because Satan will hit you. He's going to hit you when you're hungry. He's going to come after you when you're isolated. He's going to come after you when you're tired. Do you know when you're physically hungry, you get more grouchy, grumpy, tempted? <laughs> Is that not true? And what about, do you know there's a difference between solitude? The older I get, the more I see the discipline of solitude there's something to it. Not isolation, but solitude. Where I'm just like, okay, phone, you're staying there. 
Just me and my Bible, just going and just kind of getting away. I'm just gonna just take a little time right now just to have some solitude, just me and Jesus. Just think, meditate on scripture, pray. Just the older I get, the more I see that, man, there's something, that's a spiritual discipline that every one of us ought to develop. Not isolation. Isolation is when you pull yourself back. You say, well, Scott, I'm really not a people person. Hey, <clears throat> fact of the matter is, whether you're a people person or not, God has created you to be in fellowship with other believers. Every one of us need a fellowship with other believers. And so the moment the enemy can get you to isolate yourself and pull away from everyone else is the moment he can do all kinds of crazy things. Let me tell you one of the most frustrating things to Jason, myself, and Matt, and Megan, as we're leading this church, as we're a part of ministry for all these years, one of the most frustrating things is when we see God moving in your life and then we see old devil just come along and he puts something right there. And we see, we're like, oh, don't do it, don't do it. And he pulls you in. And we saw all this potential in you for the kingdom, for your life, for your family, for generations. And, and you give, and it's not that you come back, repent, and, but what we see is people pull away and they isolate themselves. And then the devil just has a heyday with them. And we see that it breaks our heart because we see how God is wanting to move. If We're going to get to number five here in a second. Not yet, but number five is going to talk about this. But you find yourself even falling into temptation. Don't isolate yourself because it's only going to get worse. In fact, let's be on the offensive and let's make sure we don't live lives of isolation. And then the other thing is when you're tired. I'm just talking about it's times like this when the devil comes after you. Now, some of you are like, Scott, tired, really? I have three kids under the age of five. Are you kidding me? I don't even know what, what sleep is. I, I, I wish I knew what sleep was. I, I can't remember the last time I had a full night's sleep. Listen, Meg and I, we've been in that season before. God bless you. God doubly bless you. There are seasons when we're going to be tired. What I'm saying is be aware. Be aware that it's in seasons of when you're tired, when you're hungry, when you feel a little disconnected from everyone. Those are seasons when the enemy is going to come in. So let's be on the offensive. And when we're tired, let's be aware. Let's make sure we're not inter- let's make, make sure we're not pulling away. And uh, let's make sure when we're when we're tired that we're just a little bit more aware of of uh, of what's going on. One one thing I'll just throw in here: Jesus was hungry, he was isolated, he was tired, but yet he was without sin. I'm, I'm just, you may not like me for saying this, but let me just say it. Don't use biological, physical desire, relational isolation, or personal fatigue to allow you to sin and say, well, God, look, it's hard. I feel like you owe me one, God, so I'm just gonna give in this time. No, you will be hit when you're hungry, when you're isolated, when you're tired. And that's why you need to make particular provision for those times and those seasons of your life when you walk through that. Let me go to number two. In fact, um, hit, someone else called it, said halt, H-A-L-T. It's hunger, anger, um, uh, lonely and tired. It's another way of saying it. But they throw anger in there. Sometimes when you're angry, you do the stupidest things. Sometimes in your anger, you sin... Be angry and sin not, Scripture says. There are times it's right to be angry. But when you're angry, don't sin. Let's keep moving. Number two, remind yourself of this. Jesus Christ has already taken care of it. When he died on the cross, when he rose again, he took care of every sin, every point, every issue of your life, every temptation. Jesus Christ says, I conquered that one. You say, well, my biggest temptation is this. Jesus is like, I rose from the grave so you could have power to overcome that. Don't forget that. Don't discount. There is hope. There is hope in Jesus. It's not in you. Oh, there is determination that God may give you. Oh, there may be some kind of dogged determination. I don't care. I'm not. But at some point, that's going to even lose its effectiveness. And, and we need to, from the very beginning, say, Jesus, my only hope to overcome this temptation is in your strength and in your ability. I die to myself and I take on you. Think about that. Jesus is the winner. In a sense, I'm the loser. Well, Scott, that makes a lot of sense now. 
I'm a loser. Jesus is the winner. Mm, I can say so much, but the truth is, we, we don't redeem ourselves from sin. Only Jesus does. Don't forget Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Check this out. When you were dead in your sins and the, the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the written code with his regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross, verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he waved it in the face of the enemy, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by and through the cross. Here's what it's saying. There's a list of laws and commands and Satan would stand as the accuser of the children of God that he would condemn us day and night and he would simply check the list. This is your sin. This is your sin. This is yours, 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 yours. This is what you did. This is your sin, your sin. And he's just accusing, accusing, accusing. And Jesus stepped in and said, but I've forgiven that. And I've forgiven that. I've redeemed that. I've forgiven that. You are set free. You're new creation in me. That's what Jesus says. He says that sin is canceled. That sin is canceled. That sin is canceled. I've forgiven you for that. You now believe belong to me, God says. I've adopted you. I've forgiven you. I've redeemed you. You're a new creation. Walk in it. You have a new identity. It's in me. He triumphed over Satan at the cross. He disarmed him. He can't defeat you. He can get you to defeat yourself. But your victory is in Christ. Listen, I have so much hope for you when you put your hope in the cross. Jesus uh, will give you a new identity that's healed, that's loved, that's forgiven, and you've been granted his righteousness. You'll never be good enough. Don't ever think you will be. Jesus' victory was our victory. Jesus' righteousness is your righteousness. Live up to what you've already obtained. See, this is why Jesus loves you so much. Some of you would have come in here and you would have said, I think Jesus is good, but sometimes he's not very fun. He doesn't let me do some things that I really want to do. And maybe, I don't know, maybe Satan isn't that bad because he'd let me do all those things. No, Satan is bad. Jesus is good. And sin is death and the devil's a liar. And you need, you need not be foolish. He's your victorious king. He's already taken care of your sin. Now walk it out. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and he shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, Ratio Spafford. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, now my sin, not in part, but the whole. It was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, you have a victorious king. His name is Jesus Christ. Number three, just a reminder, these last few, real quick. Escape is always possible. What happens is for some of us, the hook has been there for so long, it's like I can't even get free from it. Some of you, for so long, you've had, you're just like, this thing's been in my mouth for eons. I just, I try to get rid of it. I just can't. It just, I mean, I've prayed. I've gone to the altar. I've asked others. For, I just, I, I just, I don't know. I just, well, let me just encourage you. Let's stop making up excuses. Some say, I eat the bait, but it's my dad's fault. He had the same issue. He's, it's a habitual family issue. My counselor says it may even be genetic. I come from a long line of people who are addicted to this particular debate. I, I, can't, I can't stop. So I need to blame someone else, manage it, and hide it. And we think, oh, if I just, okay, really, it's not hurting anybody else. I mean, this, I know this hooker's in my mouth, and I know God wants to set me free. I know, pastor, I've heard you say it before. I know the cross, resurrection is there, but... Really, it's not bothering anyone, so I'm just, if I could just go over here all by myself, no one even knows, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'll just be right here, and I'll just sin here, and then I'll just go on with my life. Here's the deal. In every nook and cranny, your wife, your husband may not see, your kids may not even know, but here's the deal. God still knows it. I know it's so elementary, but at the same time, let's remind ourselves, there's not one place you go that God isn't there, and he sees it. And you know what I think? Listen to me. 
I don't think God's sitting there saying, oh, you stupid idiot. Scott, you dipstick. You know you shouldn't be doing that. You know you shouldn't be thinking that. You know, oh, come on. I think the Heavenly Father's like, oh, Scott, I love you. My son, you don't, come on. You don't need to do that. I, I've given you victory over that. Here's the door. Come running. Listen, I've pastored some of you for, for 15, 20 years, going on 17, 18 years. And others of you, I've been with you for a long time. I know some of your stories. And I want to tell you, God's redemption is so strong in your life. Don't ever think, because I know some of your stories, that, well, I'm just a little bit ashamed because pastor knows that I did that and that. No, pastor knows that because God's given me the opportunity to speak in your life, not to lord it over you, but like a good heavenly father, to come alongside and say, don't let that define you. And, and know this, you may have given him once, but know this, there's escape is always possible. You see, the devil thinks if he can get you to believe that there's no way out, He's one. And I just want to tell you, there's always a way out. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he also provides the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. There's always a way out. Even as you're, you're in the midst of it, what he's saying is when that temptation comes, keep your senses. Look for a way out. There's a door of escape. There's always a way out. Well, I'm already dating him or her. I'm already at the club. I'm already logged on to the internet. I already started this conversation, and, and man, it's really going right now. I'm already halfway there. Run! God's promise to you is there's always a door to run away. You have two choices. The hook or the door? Let's be a church that chooses the door. Let me just toss something out to you. I've, I've got to finish up, but here's the deal. Does anyone know what your hooks are? I mean, I think one, not everybody. <laughs> We're not going to start a line and say, Bob, could you get up here and tell everybody your greatest temptations? <laughs> Hello, all out there in Facebook land. This is Bob. These are his temptations. <laughs> But does somebody know? I tell you, that one of the greatest things you could do is find one or two, maybe in your life group or something, like, where when you're, when you're feeling that temptation, you're like, I'm feeling tempted to do this, say that, watch that, whatever, that you can just, just maybe even get a code word, you know? Tarzan. <laughs> I'm seeing a Jane. <laughs> And I'm tempted right now for Jane. I'm just, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it looks like for you. I just, I just had a piece of pie and I want to eat the whole thing. Pray for me. You know, you text them, whatever it may be. Whatever your temptation is. Somebody, anybody. And I'm telling you, part of that door, I've found often is through relationships with other people. If I know that someone's holding me accountable and that someone's going to look me in the eye and ask me a question, um, I saw that, uh, you know, you know there's a... I'm just honest question here. You doing okay? I mean, I, I'm just, I, when I know that I've given someone permission to ask that question, whew, that'll keep you from all kinds of stuff. Let's keep going. Um, number four, Satan eventually taps out. Submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Now, that doesn't mean he'll never come back, but he will for a season. Keep, it may take 40 days, but keep pushing. Fifth thing is this. Repent whenever you tap out and fight another round. Some of you, Satan tempts you, you're in a fight, and after a while you're like, okay, I tap out. I give in. I'll do what you want. I'll believe what you want. I'll behave how you want. So what do you do then? You fight, and you keep fighting. You don't roll over and give up. Scott, you don't understand. You didn't grow up like I did. You didn't have that happen to you. At some point, we've got to get past the excuses. We've got to say, Jesus, in all my past, my future, every, I just, I submit it to you, and I am now who I am in Christ. And um, when you tap out, 
When you're like, okay, I can't, I'm just tapping out. I'm going to go sin. I'm going to do whatever. The enemy wants you to just keep going back at it. And what you and I have to do is listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and turn and say, I repent. And you broke a trust. So understand, there's going to be people in this church. There's going to be people in your family that you're going to have to work really hard to regain trust because you've tapped out, you've sinned, and they've seen it, you've repented of it, they've even forgiven you of it. But be patient with others as we're patient. Will you? Be patient with one another. Be loving. Be kind to one another. But listen, the moment you tap out and you're like, I've sinned, I've given in, don't just wallow in it like a pig and it's slop and mud. But step out of that and say, I'm not going to let that define me. I'm not going to let that. I made a stupid mistake. Boy, was that dumb. I gave in and I repent. And there may be consequences to that sin. But that's not going to define me anymore. I'm not going to allow that to define me. Because I am who I am in Christ. And I'm redeemed and I'm forgiven. And I'm moving forward from here. Some of you have already been you've tapped out. Repentance is acknowledging that you bit the hook rather than running out the door. It's acknowledging that Jesus is your only hope for escape and victory. It's confessing your sin to him in humility so that the control that Satan has in your life would be broken, that you could live a new life as a new creation, a new person in Christ. Listen, time's getting away from us. But could you stand, just close your eyes. Stand, everyone stand up.